what we're calling Innovate 48. Uh, and what that is is really all lines of business across the FAA, your traffic, your track certification, policy office, every piece, every facet um, of the FAA all formed together uh, to work hand in hand with industry to be focused on what it's going to take for that integration. So we, I think, um, really closed the gap. I think there was a lot of early frustration because I know individuals would come in and have conversations with the front office, get one set of stories, you know, a set of answers, get another set of answers, another set of answers. Um, but I think um, what we've done here is number one across the board inside the FAA, everyone's aligned and focused towards that mission of integration. And hopefully what you know has been happening is that everyone's starting to get the unified message. And when you schedule a meeting with us, you're gonna see all parts of the FAA together interfacing with industry. And I've been hearing that um, you know the relationship between industry and the FAA has shifted somewhat in the course of all of this. So let's get to talk about that a little bit later. Get to Paul Brooks. Hi oh, yes, so my name is Paul Brooks. I'm with a company called Skyports Infrastructure. Uh, we're a global developer of uh, vertiports. Uh, we focus on the design, build, and operations of infrastructure for AM. And, and what we're going to bring to the, the table here is we're focused on bringing AAM out of the airport environment and into the community where it can get the most use by our uh, by our customers. Great, and that is a big topic, right? I mean, because these vertiports are going to be in the communities, and we got to you know get them on board in order for it to be a success. Colonel Tom here, please. Sorry, and thanks everybody for having me. I'm Tom Maher with the Air Force. Uh, so I've been with Brian Program and Air Force in the US Air Force for a couple of years. Um, so we started Julie Brian back in 2020. And it's focused on you know, two key big objectives. The first one was establish an industrial base uh, in this emerging market. Um, and how we did those applying resources and government, uh, support expertise, funding, uh, certification uh, reviews to help anywhere that the industry needed to help us get started to scale uh, through life. We saw that as very critical to establishing that, uh, that capability and being able to have technology not only now, but in the future. Uh, the second was how do we actually get these in the hands of the DOD to figure out, learn more about them, how do we use them, what are the considerations. Well, Laura, you mentioned a lot of things that, it's not just the vehicles, it's the infrastructure, it's the charging pieces, it's the maintenance differences, different skill sets for how you utilize these aircraft. We want to learn all of that so we can share it not only um, with other agency partners and great work with the FAA throughout, as well as with NASA, who's been done a lot of work there. So, um, we'll talk more about the things that have been going on, did a lot of good strides, We've seen a lot of good successes within the industry that are very promising. Uh, and you know, we're hitting that key point where they get to that commercial certification and how can they scale. Great, thank you. Gonzalo, I think we're Thank you very much. So my name is Juan Pablo Ramos. I'm the head of business development and sales at Uber Air. Um, I actually come from the commercial aircraft uh, industry. I worked for Airbus for more than 20 years on, on commercial aircraft sales. And I'm very excited to be part of this uh, very nascent industry and very vibrant. So uh, that, that is great. Um, so at Uber Air, what we are doing is um, and we are an OEM manufacturer. We are developing an aircraft uh, that will have the capability of carrying five passengers to the pilot in a 100 mile uh, range and we're using very differentiated technology uh, that comes from uh, our SPR founder. Uh, they make sure a lot of the technology technology we are using in our previous company, um, Car America, and then we're we spun that out into uh, Uber. So we're using a lot of that technology technology that is very differentiated to uh, create an aircraft that is going to be a lot more efficient in the way that it uses the energy. Um, in, we achieve that by using very large rotors that spin very slowly. And that achieves two purposes. On one end, we use less energy for the modification, but at the same time, we also uh, are much more quiet. So, speed of rotation. And so, that, um, that platform, as we call it, uh, enables us to create a lot of use cases for our vehicle. So, not only do we do, are we capable of doing uh, the ride share and what we talking about, which is that the big a big, uh, big business in AM, but also in the medical transport in terms of the project, and we can also do that. And so uh, we are currently at the stage where we're finalizing a full-scale production uh, prototype. We are in the final stages of putting that together and assembling it. It will be, uh, we'll start the ground phase by the end of this year, and then uh, next year we'll be doing our, our flight test. 
I'm very excited to, to see that in the air and we'll be seeing that this year. Excellent. And last but not least, Matthew Pavilion. Excellent. Thanks so much, Matt Rothman. I'm Head of Public Affairs and Partnerships for Lillian Aviation. We're a German-based OEM. Uh, we are have an Utah aircraft. It's got uh, 30 ductile electric vector thrust jets using similar technology that traditional uh, jet engines would, would use. Uh, it is a uh, six passengers and a pilot uh, aircraft with about 110 mile operating range, with hyper type certification in 2025 in the and then validation shortly thereafter from the FAA. Uh, and one of our big differentiators is that our focus really is on regional air mobility, so connecting city to city uh, versus necessarily those short haul trips. We think there's a much greater time savings there. And I think the other second thing worth mentioning here are also going to market the premium first, which means selling the aircraft just like folks here uh, today are doing in the private general aviation business market for private individuals, charter companies, et cetera, uh, for that use uh, as a great way to, to start the commercial operation. Great. Thanks for that first introduction, and there's a lot of topics that we just touched on just now, and I want to start off with a question about as we're moving towards certification of these EVTOL designs and entry to service, you know, we've got the certification journey, we've got the technology, most of these companies have figured it out, right? Um, but in addition to all of those things, what are some of the more difficult aspects of trying to bring these EVTOLs to commercial success? open this up to anyone and please jump in if you have something to add. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the ones that is certainly worth mentioning is, uh, you know, I think the regulatory uncertainty. I think that on both sides, right, we, we know there's lots of questions from regulatory agencies about what these aircraft can do and until they go through a tech certification process, it's going to be challenging uh, for them for a regular agency to understand that. But on the flip side of that is, you know, as OEMs working with operating partners, that uncertainty makes it very challenging uh, for the green commercialization you know, because people don't want to buy an aircraft when there is uncertainty about what they can do. You know, we're thrilled that you know, in, in Europe, in Yasa, there's uh, a little bit more certainty around some performance based requirements, um, but I think we're getting very close with the FAA on being able to really tell people exactly how you can operate each of the aircraft, at the very least at the very minimum, and then how we can progress that forward with performance based. Yeah, I'll, I'll say the, the other portion is zoning laws. It's a zoning. zoning. Zoning laws for the development of infrastructure. Every time you have to go in and there's a difference, that means you have to go in and reevaluate the pro pro program, which increases costs and it takes time. So the lack of standardization of zoning across the country means that you're looking at an infinitesimal number of zoning issues that you're going to have to deal with. So that is going to complicate the ability to build off airport and even on airport for the integration of some you know, technologies that may be needed to comply with those requirements. Would the FAA like to respond to any of that? Well, I was going to say that I think um, one of the challenges ahead here in the community at large is really on true integration. Because as we uh, interface with various companies, uh, the different applicants that are out there, you can just hear it in the conversation here. We're looking at different performance levels, uh, different concepts of use, and how they intend to use these for various applications. But at the end of the day, it all has to merge into the air traffic system. Um, so I think that's uh, going to be one of our big focus areas. Um, I think that's why it's great to be able to work with uh, AppWorks, um, where they're going to get some real practical experience on how the aircraft will work. Um, and that will help uh, with a lot of the sort of modeling and sim that we can do to say, what will true integration of varying performance levels like? I want to get back to something that Matt said. Um, you know, it is a German company, so they are certifying in Europe first. Um, wouldn't it be easier for the entire industry, obviously this is going to be an international effort, that the IASA and FAA kind of, or more regulars, get together and try and come up with one set of standards as opposed to each country or jurisdiction having separate standards? I mean, that would, I think, help in the certification journey and, uh, for all of them, all of the uh, uh, manufacturers. Is that yes. something that, is that something that you can respond to or? <laughs> I think, um, you know, what I see is convergence is starting to happen out there, right? Obviously everyone knows we've kind of taken different approaches to what that looks like, but there's always an ongoing dialogue um, with the ASA, with the various uh, applicants that are out there, right? To kind of seek uh, commonality. And so I think we're working really hard and we're trying to get that done. But um, obviously, we took an approach trying to use existing standards that fit the categories uh, of various uh, you know, aircraft that are out there today. And 
the risk continuum that we have and try to apply that. Um, but eventually, I think we, we will end up there with you know, a converged uh, approach between us and the yeah, I, th I think it's a, also a product of large uncertainty. We saw with the Air Force, you see the Lumia Bay as the asset, because you have many different design approaches and philosophies and vehicle not only makeup but structures that are significantly different. So that's provided a challenge where all the regulatory bodies have said, well, here's what we think they are, but as the body of knowledge and designs become more mature and they've started to build up those artifacts to, to share with them the regulatory bodies, it's informing them. So it, it certainly has been iterative. And FAA and NASA had to take a stand and say, here's what we think. Uh, the DOD military did the same thing. We said, all right, here's how we're going to assess them. It does not look like a normal uh, aircraft. For example, we walked in and they never certified an electric powertrain before. So there's a lot of learning, lack of data that you just had to accept some risks on early on, but now those gaps are starting to be filled in. But it kind of seems like a chicken and egg situation, right? Because we're looking at commercial operations starting next year or the year after, but still all this uncertainty exists and you're not going to get certainty until we know what commercialization is going to, or commercial operations are going to look like, right? So. Correct, but I will say to the FAA's credit, with some of the leading ones that are closest to that certification, they've, they said, we will work with you uh, under the current structure to get you to the certification path, and that's been great to see. And I think with that, you know, it's part of what we've heard loud and clear from the FAA is, you know, again, aircraft has to be safe and from a operating standpoint. You're know, using existing facilities, using existing facilities, going in the framework that exists today in the FAA has been the path forward. And I think it's a good path forward. It's, again, part of why we're focused on that premium market is it's way easier for me to have a conversation with the FAA about putting five aircraft in Dallas, Texas that are going to be used privately than it is to say we're going to bring 100 aircraft to Dallas, Texas. We're going to turn an aircraft every 15 minutes. And so day one for us looks very different than what we think in you know, a year or three months. And so I think being practical in the approach to commercialization from the company standpoint is also really important. I was going to say that we, we are certainly uh, looking at certifying both uh, jurisdictions, and so we collaborate uh, with any groups to be able to, to ensure that our you know, uh, concerns are, are voices heard. And so we submit our requirements to, to both the certification bodies, but uh, you know, we think that collaboration is the only way forward. And has that collaboration with the regulators, what we mentioned earlier, has that shifted or changed in the last couple of years? I'm hearing sort of from the industry that um, the FAA is listening you know, more than perhaps it did in the past um, when it comes to, you know, introducing this brand new classic aircraft. Yeah. Just to follow on, I, I would say the answer is yes. Uh, what I've seen is that uh, the FAA is putting a lot of resources, a lot of attention to AAM. Uh, in fact, we currently have a, a delegation of FAA people at our facility who are, who are working for the more certification, and use one, etc. We take it to the next stage. Uh, and so, yes, I, I do think there is a tremendous amount of focus by the authorities because they see it now as something that is here, uh, and they are putting the resources into the way they see it. And, and that extends beyond the aircraft certifications. I can say Paul and his team, Carrie Lyes, the Office of Airports, and her team, they've been phenomenal partners in the infrastructure development, helping work through complex use cases. Um, that are new in developing the processes and not working only just with industry, but working with the states, the local communities, the ADOs, and the cities where these are located to help them understand what has to be done and how to mitigate risks and to ensure the operations are safe and effective. So I think the FAA is doing a great job on the infrastructure side as well. And as someone that works with the communities and setting up the infrastructure, the ground infrastructure for this type of stuff, what are you hearing? What are some of the things that some of the communities are saying where these uh, aircraft are, are due to be operating in the next couple of years? I think the big concern really comes down to two that we hear. Um, actually, I have some One is noise. Uh, it's the noise. Um, everybody wants to be quieter. They have a paradigm. You know, sometimes analogies are good. Sometimes analogies are bad. The analogy is, one, it's going to be either a helicopter or it's going to be a drone. They're neither. They're getting you know, They're different. So by applying those paradigms, it can give you some idea, but it's different. Um, is one, electrification is two, truly understanding the electrification demand and what the impact of the local grid is going to be, what modifications are required is, is one. And the third one really comes down to firefighting. Um, 
there's a lot of unknown. I'm really glad that uh, NFPA has gone through and done thoroughly the update to, to uh, NFP 418 for the vertical the elevated heliports. Uh, I mean, we can elevate elevated heliports and vertiports. That's supposed to come out in December. And that'll really provide a lot more guidance because as written in the zoning codes, that is the definitive standard that has to be met for an elevated structure to be operated from, which we're focusing on, but it's not covered it right now. So we're waiting for the policy to catch up through industry and through the trade organizations so that we can build and get certified. So it's kind of that chicken or the egg. But uh, those are usually the three big questions that we get. And the zoning issue, I mean, that, as I understand it, that's going to like state to state or, or city to city, that's different. Yeah. Think of a municipality like we use, uh, you can use Miami as an example, multiple. You have county zoning, and you have city zoning. Each zoning city is different. So you could build one, if you build an ecosystem, you may have five different fire protection requirements that you have to build to in a region. So getting a region that we're getting the standardized zoning across municipalities, either statewide, region-wide, is gonna be a huge win for this community as we start to build and scale, because um, you're gonna need places beyond airports to scale. Um, is going to be a big issue. As someone who well, you know, spent you know, a handful of years working for a city government and working on AM, I, I think we'll, we'll get there. I think that, again, we have to recognize today, almost every, most major cities and counties have zoning for aviation facilities. And it may say heliport, but it's a fairly straightforward conversation to go in and say, okay, look, we're allowed a heliport. We're going to bring an aircraft that will be quieter than a helicopter. We want to use we're going to call it a vertical that will comply with the same zone. But most of the time, they're going to say, yeah, that works. And I think for 90% of our cases, that I know we've looked at, but the Skyport is there, we all, you know, these are, are it's going to work, right? We're going to get to that first phase using that zoning in those places. Let the public experience our aircraft. And it's great for both helicopters out here today flying. I think it's fantastic anytime anyone can see neither tall because you get to understand what we're talking about when we say it's flying. Let people experience that, and then it's going to be way easier for us to go back in and say, okay, how do we expand where you allow burn place? Now that the public has seen this, has experienced it, whether it's at the airport or existing facility. And so I think we've got to use the this as an education opportunity to lean in and help the, the public understand that these can go to your place. We can't just, the Paul says, tell them they're going to be quiet and have them trust us, right? We have to show them. Great. That's a, that's a great segue to, you know, the public acceptance part of this, right? I mean, for those on the ground, right, who are watching this stuff happening, I mean, some communities, some citizens groups have started to push back on, uh, on on these types of operations. I mean, what must the industry and together with the FAA or the collaboration of all of you um, do to convince not us? I mean, of course, we think it's cool, right? But everybody out there that this is a good thing for their community, for society in general, for you know aviation and, and for everyone. I think two things. One is you know, just practical. You have to show them. They have to start seeing the vehicles and slowly build up that trust. That's going to take time. And then the second is having a, I'd say, a well thought out explanation of why it benefits the public. You have to say, this is great. It's going to save everything. Trust us. I can mention that won't work. But you do need to have a fairly well thought out of how is this going to benefit different communities because they've all looked differently as well. Uh, but it's going to take time. I think just those initial steps of getting aircraft out there and flying and visible and around communities, maybe ones that are more receptive than others, uh, to, to then kind of build that up. Yeah, on our end, we see also a lot of education uh, that needs to be done in communities. They need to see that this is not going to be a nuisance in terms of noise. And so that's why our focus has been very much on concentrating on having really the lowest noise footprint possible. So we want to really uh, be the lowest noise we can be told out there. Um, you know, 55 decibels at the end hover, that is, that is really the, the target. And, and because we believe that that is going to be maybe the single most important aspect to get community acceptance. If we can demonstrate that it actually um, decongests cities and, and, and you can travel faster and save time, and it doesn't create a nuisance uh, on the noise side, then that is going to be very, very powerful to get the so you mentioned, Tom, it's going to take time. I, I will just uh, quote former FAA Acting Administrator Billy Nolan, who is now at Archer. He said there will be 50,000 commercial drone and EV tone flights per day 
over Los Angeles in 2028. That's not a lot of time to get people used to this kind of thing. That's not a lot of time. But I think what you'll see is that if you look up some of the leading, uh, he included all sorts of drones in there. So uh, we've actually started to see a lot of good progress on just like the small drone delivery, uh, whether it's uh, zip line or wing and things like that. Like those have started to go around. I'm, I'm excited to see the FAA move out on more areas that the bills will go out. And so that's where you're seeing a, a lot of your volume. Let's say in the EV tall and AM space, it's going to be a little bit more of a gradual build out. Just because you mentioned, asked a question earlier, what are the challenges this dealing? All these companies are getting this point where they're going to get to the production phase, and that is going to be challenging. Um, we're excited, they're making progress, they're breaking ground, they're establishing all those production uh, you know, policies and tracking, and how you actually have to do that. But that's going to take a little bit of time to scale that up. So it'll be a mix. So, you know, I was going to say, and I would say that, um, you know, when Billy was quoted those kind of numbers, something that we do annually, right, is we project the forecast of what we see in front of us. So, that is the paradigm change that I think has happened inside the FAA is trying to achieve these capabilities at scale, right, and support, you know, what we know is a, is a new and exciting industry that's coming at us. So that has been the focus, but our byline here is, you know, getting to that point of saying yes with safety assurance at the same time. Um, and so that's really the mantra that we've had, and that's what everyone's marching for. Yeah, I think the idea there is, that's a moonshot goal. In, in the question I, I like to ask when I hear those is, if we only get to 25,000, if we fail? I, I would say no, but we'll never get to 50 if we never set that goal. So it is an industry we would all want to be in. From the drone side, from the AM side, from the infrastructure side, we're doing everything in our power, in our financial means to make it happen in a safe, efficient, and effective way. But by no means if we don't get there, did we fail? I think that Billy on that, because uh, you made a good point, was that design for that your state to enable, don't, des don't design for uh, just an incremental change of how we do airspace integration or how we do airspace control of, of aircraft. Look at what that end state is and then back out. What, is, what are all the steps we need to do to actually get to that? Yeah, I mean, I think on the EV toilet side, like, we see the operations are going to be probably uh, much more gradual. And so we're concentrating on getting those first use cases and those first routes going in a safe way, in a profitable way, because that's the only way you can scale. And so you know, we are developing a vehicle to be able to do that, to, to, to um, showcase the initial use cases, whether it's you know, medical use cases, whether it's cargo, whether it's passenger, but also then be able to scale on the commuter use case, which is going to be probably the biggest one. So two of you in the last answer have, uh, have mentioned the dreaded S word, namely safety, right? Um, what happens when there's an accident? What happens when the first of these fall out of the sky? Well, I say they they have, and what we've seen in the industry is throughout the testing, there have been some incidents that. that have I mean, when, when we start doing commercial start operations, doing operations? You know, when, it, when it was becoming more mainstream, when people are seeing this, I mean, you know, yes, we've we've seen a couple of the aircraft, uh, you know, crash in the meantime, test aircraft in the test test flight phase. But I mean, commercialization, right? I mean, inevitably something's going to happen somewhere. So what happens then? That will be a very challenging time for the industry, especially if it's early on, uh, because you need to. There will be a lot of initial backlash of, uh, hey, you said you're going to have a trustworthy, safe, reliable system, and then something happens. So it's the big what if. Um, and you really have to have a clear messaging standpoint and dig down to why things happened and then communicate that to the, uh, to the public so that they keep that trust or regain that trust at that point, because it will, that will be a challenge. So as, a, as, the, as the infrastructure operator, it's highly likely that that accident is going to occur at my facility. If you look at where most of the accidents occur, they occur on the airport or near the airport or in the airport environment. I think our goal is zero. Of course. And that is the only acceptable goal is zero. That's the same as the rest of the aviation industry. We have said we are just like the rest of the aviation industry. We are planning for it. We are preparing for it. We are working with our first responders. We are working with the FAA. It'll be handled just like any other event. If we handle it differently than any different event, then we're going to create other issues. But if we have said all along, we are just like the rest of aviation, we're going to handle it just like rest of aviation. 
And the steps that the FAA and the ASA are taking are to make sure that that level of safety is there, because that's the paramount, uh, you know, key point, is that they're attaining and requiring a level of safety, the same as existing operations. And so that's the trust that the, you know, decades of the FAA and the ASA safety record have built up. It has to stay that way, you know, well. So I, I was just going to say the same comment, right? I mean, I know there's been a lot of frustration on the length of time that it has taken to get through certification, but there should also be a comfort that comes with that in, in some way, right? That um, all of the, you know, applicants that are coming through this will have had safety as the paramount, right? And we'll have done our due diligence as an industry and as a certifying authority, right, to make sure that these are the safest that we can get them out there. So I, you know, yes, it'll be a challenging time, but as they're saying, I think we'll get through that like we get through other events. And we learn from each one of those, right? And those will, once again, help inform safety, you know, in a better way, right? If, if and when that occurs, but let's hope that it doesn't. So how big does this industry need to get in order to be economically feasible, right? All of this investment is going into the vertiports, ports, it's going into the infrastructure, into the development of the vehicles, the certification, everything. I mean, what, in terms of aircraft flying, I mean, how, how much, how big does it have to get to be, you know, worth it in the end, shall we say? Matthew? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to share a specific number uh, uh, where, where, that, where there, that becomes, uh, you know, the ROI there, but, but I think it happens the way that every other industry has scaled, right? It's not an overnight. And I think any investor investing in new technology understands, right, that this is a, a progress that we are making towards, you know, being being a profitable industry, right? This is not about one company or another. This goes for the infrastructure part. This goes for everyone involved in this process. It, you know, we're, we're, you know, finishing the first phase, right? Like getting type certification is, it will be, it is gonna be a great accomplishment for Lilium, for any company, but that is the, the completion of really this first phase, right? And the next phase we go into is commercialization and scaling. And I think it's going to be, I, I think the winners and losers on first phase are those that can prove to the FAA, to the that their aircraft is safe, demonstrate that. The winners of the second phase will be those that did phase one and had a thoughtful way in which they're going to commercialize and scale um, and, and have a reasonable approach to doing so. And I think that's really the key piece here is that we can do this as an industry um, we've, you know, the industry collaborates really great from a policy and a safety perspective. And I think, you know, we all know that when we turn that corner and, and uh, you know, we're into commercialization, right, it's going to be about who can build that scale and commercialize in a way that brings in the profit early on um, and allows you to continue manufacturing, continue research and development. With these, the aircraft that is generation three for Lilium will hopefully be different than generation one. And so that will be important as well to this. We've talked about, you know, getting to more passengers, getting longer payload, right? all of those things are going to help scale. I mean, like, like Matthew, I think there's no like set number where you say at this point, then then we're scaling. I think that we need to um, find a way to make every phase that Matthew was talking about profitable, obviously safe, but also profitable. And so uh, if you can't get to the first phases in a profitable way, you're not going to survive or, you know, the industry is not going to survive to get to the big, big scale. And so most probably we'll probably have to concentrate on uh, use cases that have maybe th those um, those margins or that those those yields that enable those early use cases and those might be a little bit higher uh, cost than, than what we want to see in the very future and in, in, in the mature stage but that's okay you know the volumes are going to be smaller uh, and that's going to be uh, supported by by maybe that pricing and as we scale that's when you kind of get to mass market. That's when you're able to drop your prices. That's when you're able to make it much more affordable for everybody. And do we know how much people are willing to pay for this? I mean, is this, so you say the price is gonna be high first and then it'll come down. I mean, are there enough people out there who will be able to afford this? I, I would say this is a demonstration, right? That, that private aviation, generally speaking, right? Is not the most, you know, uh, inexpensive thing to participate in, right? And then we have a thriving, especially here in the United States, general aviation industry. And so, you know, we've announced we're selling our aircraft privately. We've announced a list price of $10 million, which includes a support and services package that makes it really uh, cost-effective uh, aircraft to operate, right? So you gotta consider that whole piece. But we recognize, right, this is not an aircraft that, you know, I'm not buying a Lilium aircraft. I, I, I do not make that kind of money. Um, but there are enough people out there that have the use cases that regional air mobility that electric aviation can meet and that you know have the time savings benefit 
for them that it is worth that uh, cost, whether that's because they buy it privately, whether it's fractionally through, you know, we're partnered with NetJets, or whether it's because they have a charter operation and they're using it on a one-off case. I think there's a huge opportunity for the first few years to go after that market, to generate that revenue, and then to begin scaling and bringing that cost in. We absolutely want this to be a service that every, you know, quote unquote, everyone has access to and is really accessible, but it's gonna take time to get there. Yeah, I, I was gonna say, is a, is a company one of the things we're really worried about from the Vertiport infrastructure is the passenger journey. And we ran a test this summer where we, we looked at Blade, one of our partners who's here at MBA, you know, doing some ferry flights back and forth, and we looked at their operation, and we did a time difference from uh, from their 34th Street helipad downtown New York, and, and unfortunately, I drew the short straw of, of riding in the Uber. Um, <laughs> it took me almost 85 minutes to get from there to uh, Newark, where my friends and colleagues took the Blade aircraft that took them six minutes to seven minutes to get to signature and another four minutes to get there so the price point difference you know if you look at it i think that the kind of the is about 150 dollars for the ev tool flight and it's you know over three maybe four for the the blade flight depending on the package or program you're in so you start talking about the time of what is that hour really worth to you at the price point so i, I think that that's kind of the, one of the use cases it's just a general term of some data and that's current is about August. So there's there, people people will move forward. And then if you look at airports, you know, you can start looking at number and frequency based on the size of the FATO and the stands and how many people are coming through. Yeah, it gets there pretty quick where the numbers match. I mean, I took the Blade helicopter at the last MBAA. It took me 11 minutes to get from Henderson to here. And yesterday it took me 45 minutes on the ground. So, I mean, I get that, right? But um, question for Lilium is, um, you know, you, you have announced that today that you're selling to um, private individuals. Is that really the way to win the hearts and minds of the general public is selling these things to rich people? Yeah, I think it's a balance. And so I think the first part is, again, I was saying, if we're, you know, the announcement today is uh, our dealer in Texas who will be selling across the state of Texas and really in the U.S. And if we drop, you know, put five aircraft in Dallas, it's, it's, relatively unnoticeable to the general public, right? So this is you know, gonna use existing aviation facilities, existing heliports, helipads. Uh, it's not gonna you know, disrupt. It requires no land user zoning or planning approvals or we're gonna have in community meetings for the most part, uh, unless there's some specific facility that someone wants. And so it's, it's a pretty straightforward thing that then allows the community to see these aircraft, right? And again, those that have gotten out, and I'll say it again, to go see Volocopter, right? Which I know say, sounds crazy for me going and tell you to go see somebody else's aircraft, but it's important to experience these things. And so the more that the public can see and hear and experience Lilium's aircraft or anyone's aircraft, the easier it becomes when, you know, 12 months later, Paul comes in and says, we want to add a Vertiport because we're going to do shuttle operations in Dallas, right? And so that becomes a way easier process when at the community meeting, we have a Lilium jet there that they're able to see, they're able to hear take off, whatever it might be to experience that. I think that is an important first step. And again, if you were thinking about what would be the ideal scenario, the ideal scenario is, Every city has three AAM EVITALs in their community before we go and blanket them with shuttle or, or air taxi operations. So if you haven't gone to see Volocopter yet, they're going to be flying again tomorrow at 10 a.m. So if you're in Henderson at that time, it is pretty cool. I went and saw them yesterday. I was so. going to just add to that. I mean, we, we've taken it over a slightly uh, different approach where we believe that, yeah, this uh, the vehicle that we're, we're, we're developing is a vehicle for everybody. And so the volume of passengers that we'll be able to carry and the efficiency that we'll have will enable to uh, cater to the masses or to really anybody. And so our, our, our objective is to be able to bring people closer together, to be able to make those trips that are sometimes too far to do by car, uh, you know, make, shorten them so people can actually get you know, together. And so bring, bring a world of possibilities closer to home. I'll, I'll share a story. So I think if you could look back at Uber, we're, you know, is our industry one, is one of the models that we look at. I, I'm, I think Paul and I may be the only ones old enough on stage to remember when Uber started. <laughs> and I remember vividly being in DC and my first Uber ride being like, this was an experience because it was different. It was, I won't say exclusive, but it had a little bit different. It wasn't, it was new, it was an Uber black. You know, everything was there. It was a little step up from a taxi. And now you don't even think about it. Like the company's name has become a verb. I mean, that's how prolific 
the industry is. I, I'm looking forward to the day when people EV toll places, you know, use a generic term to describe our industry and what we're doing. So I, I think if you only look at day one, yeah, you can make the assumption that it's not necessarily affordable to all. But if you take a long-term view of the industry, it quickly becomes scalable like Uber did. It quickly becomes affordable. It quickly becomes equitable. So I think if only looking at day one, that's a really hard question, but it, that's a very short-sighted view of what this industry can deliver. So when was that first Uber ride? Uh, that's a long time ago. <laughs> Probably 20 plus years ago, yeah. Did you want to add something, Paul? No. Okay. Um, so, you know, one of the main selling points of EVTOLs, right, we always talked about is, uh, you know, you're going to alleviate the ground traffic, uh, alleviate the congestion, don't stand in traffic anymore, fly over it. Um, but even if you have a thousand VTOLs in the air, that's not going to put a dent in San Francisco Bay Area traffic, right, if you've ever been there. Um, you know, is, is, this, is this a false promise to, you know, for the future? I, I absolutely, and you ask any transportation planner, adding a mode, adding a lane does not reduce traffic. And so hopefully we as an industry are not out there presenting that AM is going to relieve traffic congestions in cities, right? It is a, an additional mode that provides a tremendous amount of other benefits to communities. Congestion is not, a, is not solved by adding a mode like AM, right? It just, that's not how this is gonna work. And so I think we ought to be focusing on all the other benefits that it brings to a community um, and the access to communities bringing folks together. You know, like I said, we're, we're starting premium, but we do want to provide that shuttle operation. We do think that's super important and bringing those costs down and that will happen after the first few years. Um, but then we're able to you know, expand people's radius of life. We've got communities in, nor in the United States that no longer have air service, right? And that has had a huge dent on their economic opportunities for that community. And one of the things we've heard is corporate headquarters want air service if before you locate even if it's a regional office there they want air service well what if am is now able to connect them to their hub airport right so there can be actually an, a, a vertiport that skyports builds at their facility and they have direct connections now to their nearby hub airport that maybe is 100 miles away right and so we begin to provide other benefits beyond just saying we're going to take a car off the road right there are countless benefits we're able to bring anyone else want to answer that question I think what Paul mentioned earlier, it's important that we have to start somewhere. You have to, it's critically important, that's why we did our program, to get the industry started. Um, because some of those visions of, whether it's alleviation or scale, they are going to take time, but you have to get the industry started and established to even enable that future vision. Um, having that future vision was 100% okay. Uh, and probably helpful to see, hey, what are the possibilities? Do not think small, um, but they're critical to just get started. Whether it's from a pricing standpoint, uh, whether it's from a volume standpoint, it's critical to get get that going. Uber was not profitable for many, 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 many years, um, yet they continue to scale. You may see that same thing in the industry, and that's okay, as long as it continues to progress and expand out as far as through your production and eventually decreasing costs. The exciting thing on this industry is with the electrification is simplification on ops and maintenance costs. That's one of the huge benefits that we possibly see in, from the vehicle side. Um, that gets pretty exciting. So. And, and, and I would say, yeah, that as, as Matt was saying, we are basically selling the benefit of being able to save time when you really need it, when you really have a critical uh, place to go to or you have to take a, take, take a flight. And so getting those people off of the streets is, is a small step to be able to, uh, as Tom was mentioning, that bigger uh, aspiration of getting a larger volume of people off the streets, which I think personally it is going to reduce some to some extent some of the congestion because you know congestion maybe around certain areas it could decrease I and mean, one thing we haven't really talked about yet is the whole sustainability aspect of, of all of this right and the electrification I and mean, we're going to be needing a lot more power plants and you know energy uh you know to charge all the batteries um is that something that you can talk about uh tom from AppWorks side yeah so i can talk about you know steps we're taking to learn learn about that so Certainly out of the news recently, we broke ground and completed the first electric charging station on a DOD installation. We had uh, Beta Technologies install that down there to help support our operations there. Uh, Joby Aircraft, we got our first aircraft delivered to Edwards Air Force Base back in September. We'll also have charging infrastructure there. So as part of this journey of you know, supporting the industry and supporting the vehicles, 
we are also learning about all those other pieces that are critical. So what does it actually look like from an energy perspective? How can we inform the folks that are doing on the, on the industry side of you know, what were the impacts to our grid? How did that benefit? What were the drawbacks? Um, and then from an uh, Air Force perspective, how do we think about you know, deployable energy? So we have our, our into the grid systems at both those bases, but we also have deployable systems. So think of like a Connex with you know, battery packs and electronics that you can put anywhere that provide um, from a civilian perspective, you know, energy infrastructure and backups for communities that maybe don't have all that built in normally. So there's benefits on both the civilian and the government side. So there's really two questions. You have to look at point demand and you have to look at sustained overall demand. It's how do you manage those? And point demand, I mean, like if you have five stands at 500 kilowatts, do you really need 25? Is that simple math? And, and, and the answer from what we're seeing is no, it's actually probably a little bit less because not all five will start the train. Not all five of them can land at the same time and all five of them can start charging at the same time. So you're going to have a staggering based on the scheduling where you get there. So that brings that down. And there's other systems like like the Colonel talked about. You, you have a best system. You charge that best or a batter, battery energy storage system that you use to augment. And how do you use your, bat, your best system and combined with your your point charging or your chargers from the grid to manage that. And that's one of the things that Skyports, we uh, we have electrical charging team that's worked through it. And we also team quite li like across the grid globally with Siemens, Atkins, you know, any of the, the major players in the electrification space to like, what would that look like? How do we manage between point load during the day at high demand and, and a best system charge it at night? And how do you manage those two? So you stand at your point load and then you also deal with your sustained load for the facility. And those are managed through a, a resource management system and scheduling and working with the OEM. So I, I think if you look at it, you do back of the paper math, yeah, you may get alarmed, but there's ways you can mitigate that. Just like you mitigate charging your Tesla at home if you put in a storage system. You charge it between midnight and you charge it between five. There's no reason why you can't do that with your best system and then you know, relieve demand from the, uh, from the uh, community during the day. Is this something that, it, I guess the FAA is also involved in this whole battery charging story. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that um, as you're hearing here, right, there's, there is a journey here that's going to occur. Um, I think we're very cognizant of the fact that this is, the words we're using is it's an ecosystem that has to be developed uh, to support this. So clearly on, on all of these fronts, right, whether it's vertiports, um, you know, charging infrastructure, all of those kind of things, I think our interests are always in making sure that the right standards and everything are in place uh, to support those developments um, and assure that we've got, you know, like I said, that safe operational environment. And then we're really just trying to see how this evolves, right? So those early steps, um, you know, that AppWorks is being able to facilitate and that the other vendors are able to, to do, I think that's a learning process for all of us um, on what it's really going to take to support at scale some level uh, of operations. So. Um, we're looking forward to that, and I think, like I said, we're trying to get ahead of the curve here to, to really look and see what is going to be needed, right, um, to support the operations across the board. Uh, this has been a really interesting discussion, so we've got about 10 minutes left, and I'd like to open up the floor to questions. Um, there will be people walking around with microphones. If anyone has a question, we'd love to hear them. Sir in the blue here. Hey, great discussion, guys. Really appreciate all the insights that you're bringing to us. I represent an airport in northwestern Montana, and I think the technology is really cool. Uh, we want to be on the bleeding edge of stuff like this. Question I have for you is how do you see this subsection of the industry overcoming uh, extreme weather, geography, and then long distances between small communities, which are challenges I would see in our neck of the woods? Yeah, I think all those are, are very real challenges. And again, part of, you, you know, if you look at where OEMs are making announcements, right, you got to be very candid. These are in good weather operating uh, locations, right, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so it's going to take time. Um, but I think that it's, it's still, I mean, our perspective and when we go and talk at airport conferences, it's still important for all communities to begin thinking about that planning. That's not putting a shovel on the ground. That's not even necessarily hiring consultants to do planning. That's beginning to think about what is my community's benefit to this industry, right? So how does this industry benefit my community? When I started in AAM, it was at the city of Orlando. 
because it was actually not long after Uber launched. And then we had a, so an AAM company who no longer exists come in and we said, you know what, this is the kind of thing that if done wrong for our community, it'll work, but it might not maximize the benefit for us. And so I'd spend the time thinking about what are the benefits, right? So is it connection to commercial service? Is it connection to nearby cities, right? Understanding those benefits so that when one of us or one of the operators shows up at your doorstep or an infrastructure partner, you have that understanding of saying, this is what we want out of it, right? And to be able to lean, to have that conversation and to make sure that it benefits your community. So I think it will take time, uh, but I think we'll scale pretty quickly uh, on a lot of the technology in, uh, in the aircraft to ensure that we can be in, you know, uh, near, uh, uh, in, in IFR conditions, uh, to, to fly in higher altitude conditions, right? All of that will happen, again, because we're, we want to make sure that we are safe on day one. We're going to take that easy path, both on the certification side and the operating side, to make sure we're doing this right before we scale into those more com complex uh, operations for our operators. But it's coming, and so I think it's important to spend the time to think about it. Yeah. Exactly. Just, I was just going to add one something yeah. quickly. Okay, on, to... on, on the product side, and from a product development point of view, we're taking the approach at Overair where we are um, building a lot of technology into the propulsion system to be able to operate in challenging environments. So, for example, we will be able to operate in hot and high conditions, or even just you know high, not so hot conditions, uh, because we have that you know propulsion technology and it enables us to do that. You know, we are also uh, designing for for VFR, IFR, so that is something that will be kind of in the product straight out of the bat. Uh, and so we are trying to develop a product that will be most capable in most weather conditions, as 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 wide as we can. And right, there will be uh, certain evolutions in the future that will make it even more capable. But we're trying to be as capable as possible right from the start. I'd say some of the challenges that you mentioned are things that we've thought about from a DoD perspective. Same thing. So we're following the industry along as they go in their initial markets, but long term for what type of capabilities, we need to handle those things. Hot, high, um, you know, all weather type conditions, larger ranges. And so we're actually pretty excited to see what else is happening within the industry. Um, so the benefits that you see that focus of folks have, you know, focused on, excuse me, uh, you know, all of the electric setups, once you have that electric infrastructure, that opens up for other hybrid options, whether that's a high power density turbo generator, which is, there's a lot of good prog progress on that front, or other alternative fuels like hydrogen and other type of fuel cells. So those things aren't quite ready for prime time, but those things are happening in industry. Certainly a lot of from interest on the DOD side that will eventually open up larger opportunities throughout the country in different environments. Any more questions? Yes, sir, your front here in the black. Um, so, Europe made uh, Apple go to USB-C. Obviously, I want to hear from the aircraft side, the regulation side, and the ground side. When do we start talking about standardization of charging, charge carts? What does that look like? I'll take that. So, this it's already occurring. So, Gamma has taken the lead for the industry. Um, they recently published, it was in, I want to say July, a, a paper. Um, that the industry, the, I would say 99% of the industry agreed to, saying that CCS1 is going to be the domestic U.S. standard and CCS2 is going to be the standard for Europe and the, uh, and we'll call it Middle East, um, moving forward. So that work is occurring and that is occurring through trade organizations, regulatory bodies to define those standards. And as an infrastructure provider, we are all behind that because I, I can't have 15 different charge receptacles at my vertiport when I only have five stands and I can't dedicate one to one, one to just OEM. So that, that, that is occurring now, just, uh, just as it has in other industries. And is there one that's better or that's got its no, you know, it's more further along than others? Like, is there, no, you CCS, know which one is going to be? CCS1 is the, uh, is the standard that has been agreed upon by the OEMs for the United States. Okay. What about the regulator? You, you're supporting that, obviously. Yeah, obviously, anything that can be done that standardizes it's it. But, but there's always kind of that fine line, right? Uh, when you're dealing with a nascent industry that's just starting, I mean, we really rely heavily on industry consensus of performance-based standards, right? Um, and sometimes it does take a while for those to, to gel and mature. And I think that's kind of where we're seeing here with charging infrastructure and all of those kind of things is there is consensus that's starting to occur. 
So we, we walk that fine line of being the over prescriptive regulator, right, versus letting industry be able to have some some runway in front of them, right, to kind of, you know, develop and innovate and think. Um, but then eventually we do get to that point of consensus. So and that's what is starting to, to happen. And I want to give uh, the FAA a tremendous amount of credit actually on this particular issue as well, because this happened not because we all sit around a table, because as you all know, competitors tend to not sit around tables often trying to strategize about what projects we could work on together. DOJ tends to also not like that. But this happened because we had airports going to the FAA and saying, you know, XYZ company wants to install a charger. Is this okay? And to be very clear, the FAA never said, no, you absolutely can't do that, but asked the right question. Said to the airport, your responsibility is to ensure this is open and accessible to everyone. And so is the charger that you're putting on there going to be able to be used by everyone? And we heard as an industry enough of that feedback from the airports that we got together and said, let's do something about this so that we don't have, it's one less question that an airport has when making a decision about electrification. It, it, this isn't the only issue. If you, like, I, I will say the FAA has been really good going through the trade organizations. They've asked about fuel reserves. They've asked about standardized equipage. They are, they are leveraging the trade organizations as a, as a methodology to make industry agree and then communicate back to the regulator what they would like to see and then they can agree or disagree with it. So the FAA has really done a nice job that way. Great, do we have any more questions from the audience? Yes, sir, the second row. Thank you. So all the early aircraft are gonna be piloted, right? There was one company was talking about autonomy at the end of the decade, but that's not real autonomy. That is a remote station that can intervene and monitor the aircraft and everything like that. So does, from a public acceptance standpoint, does the industry ever get to the point that you have a fully non-deterministic aircraft operating with no pilot or no remote operation involvement in it whatsoever? Sir, that was on my list of questions. I'm glad you asked it. <laughs> Please go ahead. So I guess I'll take the first uh, stab at that and move forward and turn it over. Um, but I think, you know, the one thing we've heard, right, that there is no single trade space here, right? So as we said, we anticipate and they're planning for initial operations will be piloted, um, you know, and compliant in the class of airspace they're flying. But we also realize that industry is presenting us with those challenges of autonomy. Um, and various levels on the scale, right? So to that end, um, we are trying to do the advanced planning, right? So we've heard uh, 2028 timeframe, you know, you can go to some of the vendors you see on the floor there and you'll hear what they're talking about. So we have started um, really thinking hard um, around what does autonomy look like to us in the airspace? And what are the changes basically that we collectively, and I say that as a we, because it's not just on the FAA side. This is, once again, this will have to be industry consensus, right, on what uh, and how autonomy will work. So we are doing the advanced planning and everything, um, and have formed an autonomy working group, you know, to, to work with industry to really think that one through. And we do have a very short time frame here, right, to, to move forward on that. So I think a lot of challenges. The one thing I would say, though, as we start to go through and, and figure out the gaps that need to be closed, right? And we develop work plans around those things. Um, we always have the challenges too when you're dealing at least with, with us on the federal government side. If it's infrastructure that we may have to bring to bear, we have our processes, right? We don't have access to capital markets and that kind of stuff. So that always has to be planned and programmed and appropriated uh, for us to bring those solutions to bear. But um, we are starting now, right, in anticipation that that's where we end up at the end of the decade. Anyone else want to take a stab? I was going to say, on, on our end, we are taking an approach of uh, being piloted vehicle. We believe, and I think it's kind of consensus, that that is the fastest path to certification. In the future, you know, I think our vehicle will be autonomous capable, and that's something that we'll, we'll do when the time comes, when, when kind of everything is ready. Uh, but we're, we're starting with uh, piloted but with a very high degree of automation. You know, now, with the technology we have now, you can integrate a lot of fly-by-wire uh, technologies that enable to reduce a lot of the pilot workload. And so that is something we are definitely doing. So, uh, you know, the pilot is really uh, just kind of t telling the aircraft where it needs to go as opposed to you know, doing too many other things. 
Yeah, I think the trends you'll see are applications of automation and autonomy that one, improve safety, or two, reduce workload. That's where you'll see the, the buildup of those capabilities over time. So we've just got a couple more minutes left, and I'd like to end with one more final question, and I'd love to get your opinion from all of you, starting with Matthew. Um, this question is always asked at the end of every one of these panels, right? We've, you've heard it before, you've answered it before. So what is your timeline for this kind of technology for our eVTOLs to become mainstream? When is that airport in Montana going to get its bird port? Like, when is this going to be something that is going to be as natural as getting into an Uber? Yeah, Three answers, please. We've got 32 seconds. You know, for us, I think it's it, our, you know, commercial ops are post 2025, you know, a few years. I, I think it's going to take five, 10 years for us to get to this full scale nationwide uh, component. And again, it's not going to be one company. I think you'll see a patchwork of companies all across doing different mission profiles. Gonzalo? Well, we'll certify by 2027 uh, and, you know, start operation in 2028. So, as, as Matthew's saying, it's not going to be immediate. It's going to take some time. And so, you know, I can't tell you when that will be. 10 years, 20 years, mainstream. No, I think, I think like Matthew, I think 25 to 10 years. By 35. Tom. Well, that's the going guess. So I'm going to, I mean, initial vehicles out there in 25, you'll start to see that production ramp up and enter an additional markets. So that's looking at like a 10, 10, 15 years that it gets out throughout the, throughout the country. Yeah, I, I think you'll see the first sustaining, like long-term planned uh, ecosystem in 25. And then from there, it's going to grow. It may not be in the United States, but it'll grow globally. This is a global market. Great. And what does the FAA say to that? Whoa. Uh, and no, <laughs> I'm going to say my answer, one word answer is continuum, right? So we will support the, the, the applicants that are coming through the certification process now. Um, and they will be showing up shortly, right, in some immediate time frame. Uh, we will support the integration of those um, during that time frame as well. But on that continuum, as we were just discussing, you know, there's, there's a whole other set of vendors or com applicants coming in with different thoughts, different ideas, and we're, you know, the challenge here is going to be supporting all of them as we bring, you know, advanced air mobility to bear in the, the national airspace. Well, there you have it, next 10, 15 years. Thank you so much to my panelists here. Thank you to all of you for coming. Give them a big hand. Uh, we learned a lot today. And uh, have a great rest of the show, everyone.